I'm Laura Thomas, and my husband is Pastor Jim, and most of y'all know we have two daughters, Emma Kay, who's married to Austin, they live in Hearst, and Jenna, who um, is th- just called because she's flying here this weekend because she had a birthday this week, and she will graduate in December from college, and we, we have just loved being here. I have to say thank y'all so much. This past year has flown by, and everybody has just been so welcoming. And wonderful people keep saying, how is it being back in Texas? And I say, it's great. It's Texas, you know, right? (laughs) But most of y'all know, probably, if you haven't figured this out yet, that Jim is a native Texan. We're talking deep, deep rooted. His great, 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 great uncle signed the Texas Declaration of Independence. He is a proud Texan, right? I'm actually from the panhandle of Florida. (laughs) I'm a, I'm a deep, uh, we call it, you know, lower Alabama, L.A. I'm from L.A. And um, when I was in college, I went to a, a small private school in Central Florida, Stetson University, and I was very active in the BSU, or I guess now it's BCM, BCS, whatever Baptist students are. And even to the point that in the summer, I would live in the apartments that were in the building that also housed the religion department. So we had a couple professors, one in particular, Dr. Musser, who we all just loved. He would come down and play wiffle ball with us. He would eat our food. And he really made us, I thought, really take a time to believe what we believed because we believed it and not because we grew up at First Baptist Church and our parents took us and told us to believe it, which I truly appreciated that. So I ended up taking a lot of his classes as electives because I loved his classes and I thought he was pretty cool. And one of them, and don't kick me out of the church, was feminist theology. So what I learned in that class is I'm a horrible feminist. He Every time I got a chance to speak, I would make a point to say, well, God, you know, he, um, da, 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 da. And the class was full of women of all ages, from different backgrounds, some men, and they had a lot of different thoughts about who God was. And as you can imagine, in a class on feminist theology, the verses in the Bible about wives submit to your husbands came up a lot, regardless of if we were talking about Christianity or not. And at the time, I was so young, and my response every time, I think, was, well, you know, the men have to love us like Christ loved the church, and that's a lot harder than submitting. That was my defense of the scripture right there. Didn't know really what it meant, but that was my defense, not that scripture needs defending. And so today, as we talk about those verses some, most of you know that those verses in Colossians and Ephesians are probably some of the most misused, misinterpreted, pulled out of context verses that we have, even so far as people who don't understand them or are not believers can say they really dislike or hate these verses and how they make them feel. And so We are going to talk about them. In fact, I told Libby, I'm like, this set of verses, um, I could have broken into three sections (laughs) and gone three weeks. There was so much info. So I really hope y'all studied a lot so your small groups can really talk about the stuff that I'm not going to hit. But um, what I don't want to do is like so many people have done in the past, and that is pull those verses out of the context they're in. Because I believe the setup to those verses is so much more important and what we need to hear. The household living instructions are framed by or set up the verses, uh, set up by the verses around it. And as y'all know, Paul's been building each week or each chapter. I say each week because we're doing each week, right? And so when you look at it in that context, it really makes it a little easier to swallow, but yet a lot, lot more challenging. So Last week, Miss Debbie shared on the first 11 verses in this chapter, my, my Bible calls them the rules for holy living, and she reminded us that when you set your mind on something, you orient your life around it, that we are set apart for Him, and daily we make choices where we set our mind and hearts to Christ. She even quoted 
Staying heavenly minded is the only way to do earthly good. So how do we stay heavenly minded? Paul gives us the answer to that in that he tells us in the verses we're going to read the characteristics of Christ that we put on and the actions that should follow. So I'm going to read verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I believe that verse 12 starts with a really critical word, and that's therefore. I believe in the ESV version in our rooted study, it says, put on then. But I really like therefore because, you know, it's there for a purpose. So, um, but therefore means caused by what immediately precedes this or a reaction or a response to what has happened in the past. So Paul is saying for that reason, everything Miss Debbie told us about last week, everything he's been talking about, this putting on the new self is now what you're supposed to do based on that decision. It's not a separate point, but a building of the point. And I don't think that the importance of their force on our own lives can be discounted because what we choose today will be a therefore tomorrow, good and bad. And we need to pay attention to those therefores. Think about it. God provided for me in this situation at this time. So today I know he's going to provide for me today. Or it could be I got my heart broken and my trust was shattered. I'm not going to let my heart get broken again today. I mean, good and bad. It could be even as simple as I tried this really great tamale at this restaurant here, and now I'm going to eat one every time I go because I think they're great. <laughs> you know, so all those little things build up. So Paul is saying, remember your old self, the old self he saved you from, and now let's live differently or respond differently today. Psalm 105.5 says, remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. And so today we're supposed to be and see who we're called to, to be, who we're called to be. And we're supposed to put this into action in our community and then in our household. So the first thing he does is he reminds us of their new selves and reminds them of their new selves. God's chosen people dearly loved. The reminder that their membership is all dependent on his grace. It has nothing to do with who we are or our goodness. Thankfully, not our own lovableness. And then he calls us to put on Christ. And that journey starts when we accept Jesus into our hearts. But we don't stop there. And that's the therefore. Because we've accepted Jesus, we're now walking with him daily. And we're called to start putting on Christ the minute we accept him. Sarah reminded us of this a couple weeks ago from chapter 2, that we're walking in the victory. The minute we accept Christ, we're walking in the victory, and we live what we believe, and that's how we should be walking. So, what do we put on? Well, first, who tells us, and we'll hit that hopefully, to put on the characteristics of Christ. And he lists these in various other letters. He tells us in this passage, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, all the characteristics that belong to Christ and that we should wear too. And I'm not going to go deep into these because you can come on Sunday mornings at 930 and 11 o'clock and hear Dr. Thomas tell us all about the nine. There they are, okay? <laughs> so the natural outgrowth of those attitudes and the characteristics we put on of Christ are the actions. So Paul starts listing out practical applications, that, and he uses imperative verbs or the bossy verb. So this is not a suggestion. He is saying, this is, this is what you do. So the first layer 
starts with bearing with one another or tolerating one another. This is kind of the, the lowest rung on the ladder because it is something we do all the time. We do it in church. We, hang, we do it in PTA or children's sports or work. People that maybe we normally wouldn't hang out with, um, maybe difficult people, but we put up with them. We say, you do you and I'll do me. Just because we're all in church together doesn't mean we're necessarily all going to be best friends, right? But we can love one another and we can bear with one another. And so then he goes a step further. And he says, the next thing after you put up with somebody is basically to forgive them. Forgiveness. And so forgiveness is hard, right? Forgiveness is hard to receive sometimes, and it's hard to give. But how utterly inappropriate for one who knows the joy and release of being forgiven to then refuse to share that blessing with another, and especially those of us who have received Christ's forgiveness. I mean, how can we not when we know how far he's brought us? So then there's the final layer, the big one. Okay, we'll get the big puffy jacket on here. <laughs> Let's see if I can get it. I've got my Timothys up here that are supposed to help, help me if I need any help today. Okay, so we have the big one, and that is the one you put on all the others, and that is love. So love is the binding force. All other actions and characteristics only attain their full power when unified and empowered by love. Love holds the rest in place. And it binds the church together in place. And if you think about it, this is a very specific Christian viewpoint. There's a whole lot of standards of ethics out there and people doing good. But we don't just do good to do good. We're called to do it out of love, out of the love that the Father gives us. And so then, when love has its full effect on the community, it results, it results in peace. I needed like one of those big fluffy scarves that make you feel so warm. But it results in peace. And of course, Jim just talked about this last Sunday. Because we have peace with God, we now can have the peace of God. So we can give the peace from God. And that's what Paul is talking about in this passage. Acting in harmony with one another and dealing with the issues, disagreements, and community at the deepest level in our hearts. So not just saying, okay, I'm going to, again, not just tolerate. We're going up to, we're going to have a peace and we're going to settle it within us, with our hearts. As we all know, the gospel is so individual and in how we respond by faith, but it is also so corporate because he calls us to community with one another. So then he says to be thankful and be thankful. I'm just going to hold this like this. Be thankful kind of breaks the flow a little bit, but if we are full of gratitude for God, then it is easier to extend to fellow believers the grace, love, and forgiveness to put aside petty issues. Love, peace, and gratitude reinforce one another in the end, and when we're all doing these things and walking in with our layers on. I kept thinking as I was studying for this, I kept thinking that of a particular Korean drama I watched in the scene. And yes, I watch Korean dramas and we can talk about that afterward if you have any questions. <laughs> I have a whole repertoire. Um, but in this particular scene, uh, the 30-year-old daughter is coming home and she's gonna tell her parents some things that they don't wanna hear, that her life's kinda gone off the rails a little bit. And apparently, and I'm not sure if this is just in Korean dramas or if this is a full thing, but Korean moms can sometimes get upset in these dramas and they tend to kind of, you know, hit their adult children um, upside the head, not abuse, but just, you know, just like hit their children and be like, why are you doing this? And apparently her mom was a big one of that. And so right before she gets to the house, she unpacks her suitcase and she basically does what I just did. And she puts on every coat she has. And her friend is like, what are you doing? And she said, I'm getting ready so I won't, it won't hurt as much. <laughs> and as I watched that scene and as I studied these verses, 
all I could think about was if we layer up every day and walk out of our house, maybe some things won't hurt as much. Maybe those perceived offenses or those insults that we take or fears or just anything that hits us won't sink as deep and won't hurt us as bad. And in, in response, we'll give off the love, the forgiveness, the tolerance, all the things that we're called to be instead of react out of that hurt. So it, it was just such a clear picture in my mind. So the big question is, how do we do this? And I'm going to ask my Timothy here to come help me get this off. Normally, I would say that you don't uh, ever take off your layers every day. <laughs> I don't want to start sweating up here in front of you all day. So thank you, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, he tells us that we let the word of Christ dwell in us, which is to inhabit or live with us. We layer up. We spend consistent time with him. As James 4, 8 says, come close to God and God will come close to you. And two, we remember what Christ taught. We teach and admonish one another or teach and counsel. The Living Bible says, remembering what Christ taught and let his words enrich your lives and make you wise. So it's not just knowing, but using this knowledge as wisdom. And while we are to learn from our pastors and our teachers, Paul is saying everyone, all of us who know that Christ is to be at the center of our lives and the center of our community are called to teach and admonish one another. Um, and this is a point that he reiterates again in 1 Corinthians 5, where he basically says, call out other believers. We don't have the right to call out non-believers. We don't have the right to judge anybody. But again, those of us who know the message of Christ should be at the corporate experience so we can call out each other. But the thing is, we do it in all wisdom. I think we miss this sometimes. We need the insight into the situation and the people being addressed. So we are called to hold one another accountable, but we're also called to discernment. A lot of times, and y'all have probably all experienced this, people say some great things or needed things, but they so say it at the wrong time. <laughs> or maybe they say it with the wrong heart or the wrong motivation. And so it's important to be in tune with Christ and so that he gives us that wisdom and discernment and that we are listening and obeying to when we're supposed to say something and when we're not. There is a big difference if someone who sees me across the church or sees something I posted on social media comes up to me and says something to me. Um, personally, I believe that if God tells you to say something to another woman that you don't know, it's an encouraging word. I never, I never think that we are to say something critical negative if we don't even know the person, right? But if, say, one of my ladies in my D group come up to me and say, we're a little concerned about this, I'm going to listen because they are, you know, they are um, committing to hold me accountable and they are committing to um, watch out for me and to pray for me. And so they have a little bit bigger role in what I'm, not that I wouldn't listen to something, not that I wouldn't listen to somebody who came up and said something to me, but the weight of it is going to be a little different based on knowing who is using their wisdom and discernment that God's given them and who's not. There is, um, I have a painted picture over my desk now. The year before we moved here, I was in a very stressful job and I had it in my office there. I had gotten a sweet friend of mine who is crafty and creative to write the phrase, your words, your wisdom on this beautiful picture. And in my office, whether I was talking to somebody, I could see it. Whether I was at my computer, I could see it. Because I wanted to know that everything that came out of my mouth in this stressful situation, that I was seeking God's discernment and his words, his wisdom. I even, I think, quoted it several times to myself driving here this morning. <laughs> Um, but it's just a way to remember, something to remember, that before we speak, do it in all wisdom. So then he talks about singing. Some of us aren't singers. 
Um, and I believe, though, that this verse ends all the worship wars because he mentions psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So there you go. All of them are good. Um, really, they're all good unless they're bad theology. It's all about the theology, right? But teaching and admonishing is to be a part of life, of a life of thankfulness that overflows into song. This is an outpouring of deep worship that we can't help but give. A couple weeks ago in choir practice, Brad read out of the book Worship Essentials, and he read, Music is an outburst of the soul. With music and worship, we exalt Jesus Christ, encourage, edify the body of Christ, and gives us the power to evangelize the lost. We can probably all think of a time when something happened and we just wanted to sing, or we just wanted to dance, no matter if you're a good singer or not. You wanted to put that song on the radio, or, as he also mentioned in the worship night last week, a song has spoken to you because it's that outburst of the soul. So when we're thankful and when we're forgiving and we're loving and we're doing all these things, it comes out of us. And Paul specifically talks about music and the way that that happens. So where does this all lead? I think that verse 17 is the grand thesis of this chapter. It is kind of like the WWJD, you know, what would Jesus do statement of Paul, where he says, you know, basically, can I really do this? Can I do all this if I'm representing the Lord Jesus? And it says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This isn't just simply uttering Jesus' name, but calling us to act always in concert with the nature and character of God. Whatever is whatever. It is every word out of your mouth. It is every thought from your heart. It is every action, not just the big ones, because big and small have eternal value. But basically, as one commentator put it, the totality of our existence must now be lived out with him constantly in mind. That's that's hard. Every thought out of our mouth, every thought from our heart, word of our mouth, action with him in mind. And that's why you can't pull the rest of this chapter out of context without examining them, the verses through the lens of those words. Because husbands and wives aren't just called to submit and love like Christ, but they're called to follow these verses. Those roles that we're going to read about, that we're going to talk about in, for just a minute, come after what the rest of the Bible teaches to every believer. And that's why if you're single, you can't just skip over them because it, it relates to you as you prepare for your future by growing in all those areas. We're all to be growing in those areas. So then you can already be living and growing in them to when and if God puts you in this place of marriage and family. Because as we all know, the uh, home is a great laboratory and maybe not for you, but marriage puts every one of these to the test. If you didn't know that, we can talk later too. So... Understanding that, the context of these guidelines, this now, these next verses are now a lesson on how to be truly oneself in Christ and then how to set the other members of your family free to truly be themselves. So Paul starts with the women, wives submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord and the men for husbands to love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And I figure that's because, you know, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. And we're the heart of the home. And I mean, God knew that, right? So he was, he was ready. So Paul was ready with that. I saw a clip a couple weeks ago of Christy McLellan, a Lifeway teacher, talking with several other Lifeway speakers. And she mentioned the first two words in Genesis chapter 218, where it says, I will make a helper suitable for him. Those words for woman in Hebrew are Ezer Kenegdo, and, you know, I'm from the South. I can't pronounce things well, but that's what they are. And that means helper, aid, or strength. Strengthening someone in a way they cannot do for themselves. Not secondary, not subjugation, not subservient. But the interesting part was she said this word is the same word 
that God used to describe himself in relation to Israel. So think about that. God's not secondary. God's not subservient. He aided, he strengthened, he helped Israel. It is a great frame of mind coming into these verses that we should be strengthening those around us, specifically our husbands. It's an inclination for the woman to receive and affirm her husband's leadership. And then it does not mean waiting around and not having a position or an answer, etc. But it basically it puts the responsibility on the husband's shoulder to take that role to care for the women and children to see them win. And basically, if you don't, God's coming after you. I mean, if you think about it, if you look back in Genesis, you know, Eve took the apple. Eve kind of started it all. But when God came looking for him, it specifically says, but the Lord called out to the man because he put him in that role. Paul is offering a careful balance here. The wife must forgo the temptation to rule her husband's life, while the husband must ensure his love for his wife, like Christ for his people, always puts her interests first. He must avoid the temptation to resent her being the person she is, who God called her to be, because we are not just extensions of our husbands. Neither party is to be arrogant or domineering. And then what's the context? What we just read. We're supposed to be living out the nine. We're supposed to be tolerating and forgiving and loving and peaceful and, thank and being thankful, doing everything in the name of the Lord. A little bit more challenging to submit, but yet at the same time, everything we're supposed to be doing is for the Lord. If you pull this verse out of context, like so many people do, you're basically calling out the entire rest of the Bible that talks of the equality of men and women before the Lord, starting in Genesis to Ephesians 5, 21, the same set of passages, but right before he actually says, submit to one another. Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For all, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And those are just to name a, three, a few. There is never a hierarchy that is God demand a woman. God is the ultimate authority for both of us. And another thing to realize this has nothing to do with women and any other man but their husbands. So I think you see a lot of this in our romance culture with these young girls. And they're boy, I'm not saying you shouldn't be nice and serve and love your boyfriend or whatever, but they're not your husband. And sometimes we put a little too much emphasis on um, women's roles before they are wives. And then another thing you'll notice is it does not say obey. I have to tell y'all, I thought I was a big rebel when I got married because I did not say that I would obey. I thought I was like rebelling, but it's just biblical. I was following the rules. <laughs> you know, hey, obeying is reserved for children to parents and to slaves to masters or employees and employers today. And because obedience orders issues, there's no choice in the matter. Cement is voluntary. It's a willingness to recognize and put oneself under the leadership of someone else which is why that choice of a husband is so critical for both of us to know that God's the ultimate authority and we're both answering to God. So in speaking of children, because Paul gets into children next, this is a balancing act too. Um, children need discipline, but so do parents. And yes, he addresses the father in this passage as the head of the household, but it is for both parents. And we can't really overemphasize, I read this statement and I, I appreciated it. We can't overemphasize not sparing the rod, but then overstress the rights of the child to trample the rights of everyone else for fear the child will be disappointed. And I believe we have a lot of this mixed up roles in our society today. I think my two daughters who are now 22 and 25 are some of the coolest people on this planet. When they call me, when they call me and want to do something with me, it is exciting and I want to spend time with them. And I, we're getting to that stage where they are my friends because I share with them stuff and they share with me stuff. But when they were in my household, they were not my friends. And they know it. They will tell you, mom was not our friend. She was our mom. I have to say this, and if you've done this, I'm sorry. But I think one of my cringiest moments is when you're on Facebook or social media and you see somebody and they're with their seven-year-old 
and they post, you know, like me and my bestie uh, at the Braves game or me and my bestie out doing this. And I just always want to be like, really, if you have a seven year old as your best friend, do you have big issues? <laughs> like We've got a whole nother other thing. I know it's just cutesy, but that's just that's just a cringe thing for me. Sorry. But um, <laughs> our love for our kids is not conditional on our children's obedience. But just like Christ is with us, when we as parents take up our role with our children, hopefully obedience becomes a part of their response, even when they're acting like typical teenagers. We're called as parents to live out the gospel to our children, assure them they are loved, accepted, and valued for who they are, and then they find their place in the family. And so last, he brings up slavery, and people always say, why is this brought up? All the verses on rules for slaves are because in that culture, slaves are part of the household. You can't think of it as Civil War America and how we have slavery in our heads today. Um, We see many places, even in the last verse that Miss Debbie read last week, that all are equal, but he had to address the culture of the time. If you look in 1 Corinthians 7, he even tells them, if you get a chance to be free, take it. Go, you know, be free. But because they could not inherit property at the time, an earthly reward was not motivating to them. So he focused on the inheritance of what's to come. And for us, we can look at this as an employer-employee situation, as working. We have to look at it as the roles that we go into in the workplace, whether you're getting paid or not. As Christians, we must walk in with all our layers on and not merely doing, excuse me, the minimum required to avoid rebuke or only showing effort when we are being observed. But if we are serving Christ, as Paul says, we are not only serving our boss, but serving the Lord. I read this week in Priscilla Shire's new book, I Surrender All. She was talking about this and she says, makes this comment. First of all, to remember there is no separation between Sunday and the rest of the week. And then she said that in Hebrew, the word work and worship are not two different words, but they're summed up in one word, the word avada, used more than 1,000 times in scripture as a seamless nature of daily toil and their service and worship to God. So their work, when accomplished with integrity and unto God, was their worship and service to him. We are to stay focused on what we're called to do, not on others. And then he kind of says that whatever again, whatever, do everything in the, for the Lord and work in it with all your heart. We're serving the Lord and out of that we serve others. And we don't always see the big picture sometimes because sometimes we're at a job and we're like, why are we here? This is awful. But sometimes we don't see, and sometimes God moves us, but sometimes we don't see the final outcomes. Who's watching us? um, How our reactions, our responses impact those around us? They're only known by Him. We're called to serve, walking in every day with our Christ on. So there's a lot here, and I'm wrapping it up because I know I've talked a lot. But the big question is, how are we doing layering up these days? And I'm going to be real real honest with you. I'm just going to lay it on the table. I'm somewhere in this big, long path of menopause. Sorry, young ones, it is not just hot flashes. It's brutal. It's brutal, and my generation is going to make sure y'all are more prepared than we are. (laughs) But I feel like every day I'm in this fight to figure out, you know, to keep my thoughts in my head, to not have the thoughts in the first place, to not say them out loud. Um, There are days I'm really searching for what to be thankful for, to see my husband for the gift that he is and not because he's chewing really loud beside me or something. And there is a lot out there in right now, you can go down this kind of rabbit hole. And I was actually kind of doing that when I got this um, passage to study about the mental load of women. Do I believe the mental load of women is real? Yes. But if you go down that rabbit hole of bitterness and focus on the wrong thing, and not what God is calling us to do. It leads to things, to a place we're not supposed to be. I'm never gonna tell you not to speak up. 
if you're in a situation that you shouldn't be in. But at the same time, we are to live out our roles within the family. And it bothers me. I don't know about y'all, but it bothers me when I have those days. And I'm like, where are those thoughts coming from? And why am I doing that? And so I'm trying right now to do everything I can to not let men and paws control me and to live out what who God called me to be. And it's a daily process. So I challenge you in that today. What is hindering you from layering up with the characteristics and actions of God? From fulfilling the role that God has given you in your household, in your community, and in your life. Maybe it's a lot more than hormones for you. Maybe it's a broken trust issue. Maybe it's a situation that you cannot take back. Uh, maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's a trauma from your past or not having examples of how to live the roles in the family. Basically, whatever stronghold that it is, I encourage you to figure it out. And I don't, don't just live in it, but figure it out and do what it takes. God's given us so many resources to figure that out. And he is so much stronger than all these earthly traps that we find ourselves in. He gives us the strength as we abide in him, as we grow in him, and we layer up every day because his mercies are new every morning. And so we get to wake up and decide how we're going to live each day. What are we going to do with the therefore from yesterday? I want to end by reading those verse, first verses again, but I want to read them from the message version just because I just like how down to earth this reads. <clears throat> So chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, and discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other and step with each other. None of this going off and doing things on your own and cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing, sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your life, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us daily chances to come back and learn more about you and study more about you so that we can grow and abide in you. And Lord, we surrender today our whatevers, everything that comes out of our mouth and our hearts, and as I read this week, replace our mistakes and our thoughts with more of your presence. Let our therefores bring you glory and bring you honor. In your name I pray, amen.